Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page, and it is Thursday morning, July 14th, 2022. Hope everybody's doing well today. We are ready for 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're cross-posted onto the Near Churches page, and we'll get started here in just a minute. Let's see. We've got Brian. Good morning to you. Lyle, good to see you. Good morning, Tanya, Gail, and Sarah, Linda, Connie. Man, they're popping up here faster than I am. Uh, let's see here. I really... Hmm. <laughs> Laura, Michelle, Con okay, I think I've got you all covered. I, I don't know how to pronounce this name. Vingero, perhaps? Good to have you. Norma, good to see you. All right, guys, Second Corinthians chapter 3. That's where we are. Of course, today's Thursday, so it'll be the last stream for the week. And uh, as we closed chapter 2 yesterday, Paul was talking about his manner of conduct, you might say, among the Corinthians. Hello, Shirley. Good to see you. His manner of conduct, and one of the things he said there at the end of chapter 2 was that he was not um, one of those who peddled the Word of God. The New King James uses the word peddle. And the King James uses the word corrupt. And uh, it's, it's actually a, like a financial term, taking financial advantage of somebody. And that's exactly, Peter says that exact same thing about false teachers. Hey, good morning, Sheila. That they would make merchandise of people's souls. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. So Paul said that's not how we conducted ourselves. Um, he didn't depend on himself. His sufficiency was not from himself, and that's what he's going to deal with here in the first part of chapter 3, where we start today. And um, one of the we're, we're going to learn a little bit more, because 2 Corinthians is a major, let's say, uh, Paul's major defense of his apostolic authority, because it's been challenged so extensively, particularly in Corinth. And as we read chapter 3, we learn that this is a Jewish influence within the church, um, their minds are blinded by the reading of the law, so we know it's of Jewish origin, and that seems to be the case. You follow Paul through the book of Acts, and you see that persistent persecution coming from that particular group of people. So, um, you, you know how we've conducted ourselves. It's out of sincerity, 2 Corinthians 2.17, from God, and we speak in the sight of God in Christ. He knows he's accountable ultimately to God. One of the interesting things as you read throughout 2 Corinthians, and this comes out a few times, is that these false teachers, false apostles, as he refers to them in chapters 10 and 11, was that their concern was comparing themselves with themselves. Paul says, no, that's, uh, that's not the standard. And that same thing is true today. Um, am I right with God? That's what matters. It, it, we don't compare ourselves. We shouldn't compare ourselves to other Christians uh, preachers shouldn't compare themselves to other preachers. If you're doing what's right, you're following God's Word, um, you're, you're faithful, you have the right motivation, that's what matters. And so Paul addresses that here beginning in chapter 3. And in fact, he asks the question, do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or do we need, as some others, epistles of commendation to, learn, uh, to you or letters of commendation from you? Well, those questions, hey, Lottie, good to see you. Those questions answer themselves. No, we don't need all of that. You look over in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, and as in, in this particular context in chapter 10, which, of course, ultimately we'll get there, but he's talking about these false apostles, and he says, for we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. So that's not his standard. Other men are not um, Paul's standard of sincerity, of truth, and of faithfulness. And so back to chapter 3, that's what he's talking about. You are, are, you are our epistle written in our hearts. The work, Paul says, that I did among you shows that I am an apostle of Christ. And again, you can go back to Acts chapter 18 and read about that. Uh, his first trip there, on that second missionary journey, the establishing of the church, and all of that. <clears throat> That's the evidence that we have. I'm not going to commend myself or get somebody to write a letter for me. Known and read by all men, clearly you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us. You know, that's 
that that congregation was the result of his work, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tables of stone, but on tables of uh, on tablets of flesh. That is, of the heart, and that's the nature of the gospel. It addresses the heart. It's it's as Paul says in Romans one. What is it? Verse eleven. Maybe it's verse eight. But anyway, Romans chapter one somewhere. Paul said that he served God. He serves Christ with the inner man. And the gospel is designed to do that. It's designed to reach into the heart and to change man at the heart. It's not just about the externals. Now, it is about the externals. We, we know that we have to do things right. We have to do things in the right way. But it has to come from a heart that's right and um, a, a conscience that is clear because we've done what's right in God's sight. And we talked about that a bit yesterday in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and Paul's clear conscience. So that's, how, that's precisely how the Christian needs to conduct himself today. If my life is in line with the Word of God, I can have a clear conscience, and it doesn't matter what other people say about me. It doesn't matter what other people think about me. And uh, sometimes we fall into that trap, and we feel that, you know, if we're, if we're doing what God would have us to do, and let's say you get, how would you say it? You get called out by somebody for doing something that a Christian ought to do or ought to say, you're like, well, maybe I ought to change course. Well, you, you begin to question yourself sometimes. Let's say it that way. When, when you're called um, hypocritical, when you're called judgmental and harsh for standing up for what the Bible says, and you can, you can really begin to question yourself. But if you're doing what God would have you to do in the way God would have you to do it, don't apologize, don't feel guilty for that, and um, you keep pressing forward. The gospel's designed to change the heart. So, he starts then in chapter 4, I'm sorry, verse 4 here of chapter 3, talking about his work. He says, And we have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as being from ourselves. So, you know, talks, uh, Paul talks about in, his, in other writings, what is it, 1 Corinthians 15, 8 or so, he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. He realized that. You and I need to realize that too. You know, this, this idea of, uh, one of our instructors used to say at school, you know, if you see a turtle sitting on a fence post, you know it didn't get there by itself. We need to realize our dependency upon God. And the, um, well, some of the Beatitudes touch on that. Kind of like the blessed are the poor in spirit. All right, we, we realize our dependency upon God for everything. Uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. There's an appetite that a child of God has that should never go away. You know, we could, I guess we could go on and on there, but we're not sufficient of ourselves, Paul says, but our sufficiency is from God. So, as an apostle, of course, he was chosen by God as one out of due season. That's, of course, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Um, you can read in 1 Timothy 1, verses 11 through 15, he talks about the fact that God chose him. Even though he was the chief of sinners, God chose him, extended his grace to him, and, and that, that appreciation and that love never left Paul's mind, I don't think. God has made us sufficient, notice this, as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And now, beginning in verse 7, He's going to, to show the, um, the distinctions between the law of Moses, that which is written on tablets of stone, and the law of Christ, that law which is written on the hearts of men. But notice here in verse 6, he said, "...who made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant." Okay, this word covenant, uh, it comes from the Greek word diatheke, and you see it translated sometimes in the New Testament as covenant sometimes as the word testament. Uh, you find it 33 times in your New Testament. What we're dealing with here, he says we're sufficient ministers of the new covenant. Well, if there is a new covenant, well, what does that imply? That naturally implies we can infer then that there is an old covenant. I actually read an article, oh, a few years ago, written by a and I use this term very loosely, a preacher in the church who denies that there is any distinction between the 
Old Covenant and the New Covenant. He calls the New Covenant what we would refer to as the New Testament. He calls it the renewed Old Covenant. You don't see any concept like that in the Scriptures. You have an Old Covenant. And in fact, there are multiple places in the Old Covenant, in the prophets, that tell us there's a new covenant, a different kind of covenant that's coming in the future. And of course, we see that in Acts 2, beginning with the gospel being preached. But there are those who deny the the um, the distinction between the law of Moses and the law of Christ. Paul didn't do that. He knew there was an old covenant, and he knew that he was a minister of the new covenant, which was of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Um, the, the apostles were guided by the Holy Spirit to reveal this. Ephesians 3, I tell you, if you want to read a good passage on that, read Ephesians 3, verses 1 through 6, because Paul talks about the role of the Holy Spirit in the preaching of the gospel there. Anyway, so let's start here in verse 7 now, and let's notice the distinctions here between the old covenant and this new covenant of which Paul was a sufficient minister. Now, if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones. Now that phrase right there in verse 7, written and engraved on stones, that tells you precisely what we're talking about. There's no other th- there's no other way to understand this passage. Paul is contrasting those 10 commandments, the law of Moses with the gospel of Christ. So, and and if you want some Old Testament references, Exodus 31:18 and Exodus 34:1. Those passages talk to us about the Law of commandments that were engraved in stone by the finger of God. Okay, so anyway, but if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, notice this, which glory was passing away. Now this all goes back to Moses being up on the mountain, being in the presence of God, Uh, receiving the law of commandments, and then coming back down the mountain to the children of Israel. All of that's Exodus, well, I I guess you could say starting in Exodus 19, read through basically Exodus chapter 32, and and you can get the, the background to this. But notice it's called the ministry of death. Well, what does that mean? So you turn back to Romans chapter 7. Uh, Listen to this, Romans chapter 7, uh, verse 10. The commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. See, what the law of Moses did, and and Paul discusses it at great length there in Romans chapter 7, is it pointed out what sin was and what the consequences were. It's not until the law of Christ that you have freedom from the law of sin and death. I mean, that's Romans what we're dealing with here in 2 Corinthians 3, specifically verses 7 through uh, verse 18, through the end of the chapter, it's like a condensed version of Romans chapter 7 and 8. Romans 7 is, here's the old law and what it looks like. Romans 8, here's the new law and what it looks like. <clears throat> so it's the law of death, or rather the ministry of death, 2 Corinthians 3, 7, in the sense that law cannot forgive sin. Law just, it tells you what the law is, what God requires, and what the consequences are if you break the law. But it was glorious, okay? And even there in Romans chapter 7, in verse 12, Paul says, um, the law was, the commandment was good and holy and just. Well, God was the author of that. He gave that system, if you will, of law to the Israelites. It was their, it was their um, religious, but as just as much their civil law, the theocracy, we might call it today. It was glorious. Verse 8, how will the ministry of the Spirit, so here's the contrast, you've got the ministry of death, the new covenant is the ministry of the Spirit. How will the, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, that's the old covenant, and it did, again, the, the Ten Commandments originated with God. And let me say this just real quick. We shouldn't limit the what we call the Ten Commandments to the Ten Commandments. You read all ten of those. You can do it in Exodus 20, verses 1 through 17. You can do, do it in Deuteronomy chapter 5 in the first, what, 20 verses or so. There are, as we call it, Ten Commandments, but there are a multitude of laws that fall under the Old Covenant, 
And every one of those laws falls under one of the Ten Commandments. So we, need to, we always need to keep that in mind. Uh, anyway, verse 9, For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, that's the law of Moses, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. That's the new covenant. That's the distinction being drawn here. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. The, the new covenant is so much better than the old. Now again, that doesn't mean that the old covenant was bad. It, and it, it, it's no reflection on the, the, um, the author God of the old covenant. It was a different covenant at a different time and for a different purpose. It was all pointing to Christ. But it's like the book of Hebrews says in Hebrews 8 and verse 6 that we are under a better covenant that was established upon better promises. And so um, it's not that the old covenant was bad, but there's a so much better covenant. Verse 10, For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away, that's the law of Moses, was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. And you have to remember, okay, why is Paul writing this? What's his point? Is he just addressing the, the distinction between the law of Moses and the law of Christ? No. Part of the problem in Corinth was that these Judaizing teachers, these people who had become Christians from a Jewish background, were trying to pull the church of Corinth away from, from Paul's apostolic authority. And that's, that's really, I would say, the main issue that he's addressing here. But this is one of the best chapters. If, you're, if you ever talk to somebody about the Old Testament and the New and what are the differences, this is one of the best chapters to use because it's so specific. So, verse 12, Therefore, since we have such hope, the gospel, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly. And again, all this right here, in verse 13, is recorded in Exodus 34. He put a veil over his face so the children of Israel could not look steadfastly, look, at the end of what was passing away. The law of Moses was never intended to last forever. God had a plan to save mankind, and it was not through the blood of bulls and goats. Hebrews 10, verses 1 through 4. It was through the body and blood of his Son. But their minds, verse 14 were blinded, for until this day, Paul's writing in the mid-first century, says, even up until now, their minds are blinded. The same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. Okay, so look, remember back in verse um, 6, the New Covenant. Well, now you have him talk about the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. Same word, diatheke. In the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ... But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. The, the Jewish people could not let go. They had so much trouble letting go of the Old Covenant. I mean, read the book of Acts. You see it repeatedly. Um, and, and most of your epistles deal with this too. But the Old Covenant said a new covenant was coming. The Old Covenant said that there's a Messiah coming. It, it pointed forward every, in every way to Christ and to His sacrifice and to the church but these people, the Jewish people who had had that law for, let's say, approximately 1,500 years, they just couldn't let it go, even when the Messiah came. You know, I always think of John chapters 5 and 8, particularly John chapter 5. One of the things that Jesus tells his Jewish audience there is, if you'd believed Moses, if you'd believed his writings, you'd believe my words. So that was their problem. The, the veil, their, their eyes are covered. They're blinded by their own tradition, all right? Verse 16, nevertheless, nevertheless, when one, is, uh, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I'm not convinced here in verse 17, so I'm looking at a New King James Version. The word Spirit's capitalized both times there. Hey, Kiza, good to see you. From Uganda. Anyway, verse 17, I, I'm not convinced that the word Spirit should be capitalized there. I don't think it's talking necessarily right here about the Holy Spirit. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, uh, there is liberty. 
Now, it could be a reference to the Holy Spirit because like Romans 8 verse 1, um, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. But I think we're talking about in general here the Spirit of the Lord. Um, Jesus himself had a Spirit and it's not always a reference to the Holy Spirit. But that's where liberty is. It's in Christ. You know, we studied recently, eh, what, a few months ago, I guess, we studied the book of Galatians, and Galatians talks extensively about the liberty. Galatians 5.1, for example, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again in, with the yoke of bondage. The yoke of bondage is the old covenant. The liberty is, is in Christ. So that's exactly what we're dealing with here. But we all, verse 18, with unveiled face. Okay, if you've obeyed the gospel, if you know the truth, the veil of the old covenant's been taken away. With unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Remember, Moses was not permitted to see the full glory of the Lord. Um, what is that, Exodus chapter 33, maybe? But anyway... In the New Covenant, you can see the glory of the Lord. It's, compa- it's, it's called a mirror here. James uses that same language in James chapter 1. We're being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. The Old Covenant was glorious, but the New is so much better. The Old led to the New, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. It's by the Gospel that you see the fullness of God's glory. You see the fullness of God's plan, and it's all... It all culminates in Christ. That's the message of the gospel. And these people who are causing trouble in Corinth, they're the reason this chapter was written and why Paul draws such a stark contrast between the... Well, notice the the language. A, such a stark contrast between that which kills, the ministry of death, the ministry of condemnation and that which is passing away, okay, four descriptions of the Old Covenant here, versus that which is more glorious, exceeding in glorious, or excels in glorious, hope, unveiled, liberty. Just look at the contrast of the words in verses, really verses 6 through 18 here, that show you there is a New Testament, verse 6, and there is an Old Testament, verse 14. One of, I, I would say, and I, need to, I know I need to wrap up, I've gone over a little bit here today, but in my experience in dealing with folks who are from a religious background, let's say, not of the Lord's Church, but of Protestant denominationalism, one of the biggest distinction issues that they have with the Bible is the Old Testament and the New. And uh, that's something that needs to be addressed. There, there has to be that demarcation in a person's mind between the Old Covenant and the New. If we don't see that, if we don't understand that, then we're going to have a lot of trouble understanding the New Covenant and understanding the Bible in general. All right, guys, that's what I've got for today. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I appreciate everybody being on here today. I don't see any questions or comments. I'm scrolling back through here, but thanks for being on here today. Like I said, it's Thursday. This will be our last stream for the week. Lord willing, we'll come back Monday. And we'll pick up in 2 Corinthians 4, in fact, the first phrase, Therefore, since we have this ministry, and that ministry is the New Testament, the gospel of Christ. So, that's where we'll pick up. Hey, Miss Barbara, thank you. Good to see you. All right, guys, I hope you have a good weekend. And, um, well, hope to see you back here Monday. Have a good day.